Uh, we are going to uh, hear shortly from Professor Peter Kaufman of the University of Richmond. Uh, but according to standard introductory format, I need to start by telling you that he got his PhD from the University of Chicago in 1975, and ultimately established himself at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill for the next 30 years, and he retired in 2008. He had an active career as a professor in both the Religious Studies Department and the History Department. He's published six books, dozens of articles, and his most recent book is called Religion Around Shakespeare, uh, which is an interesting work that doesn't talk so much about Shakespeare as about the religious world in which he lived, that invisible thing that he reacted to. Um, it's published by Penn State Press, and uh, they like the idea and the concept so much, they've made the whole concept into a series. So we'll be seeing a number of religion around books. Jane Austen just came around, came out, uh, and there will be others uh, in coming years. Now, when you're studying something, and you're trying to figure out what it is, the most important part of the process is to look at what you don't see. For what you don't see defines and determines the character of what you do see. And this observation applies to people as well as things. And to give you a sense of the Peter Kaufman, the man that you're going to be looking at for the next hour, let me tell a story uh, told by Douglas Whittle, the co-founder of Global Global. My girlfriend, says, Pete, uh, says Dennis, thought Peter Kaufman would cats me out. She dragged me into one of his religious studies classes at the University of North Carolina. The class discussion was lively, but seemed ridiculous to me. It had little to do with religion. Peter just kept badgering us about how we knew what we were saying was true. I found the whole thing incredibly irritating. Nonetheless, Professor Kaufman became one of my greatest professors, mentors, and friends. A few years later, I got a call from an organization in Texas, and the director said, we would like, we like the work you're doing at Global Giving. We want to give an award to the person who taught you how to be an entrepreneur. Can you send us his name and bio? Without hesitation, I sent them Peter's bio, and a few days later they called back. Are you sure you sent us the right person? <laughs> this seems to be a religious studies professor who's written books like Thinking of the Laity in Late Tudor England. Oh, don't be fooled by that, I said. What he really does is bug the crap out of his students to convince them not to accept conventional wisdom and to look at the world in different ways. Surely that's what entrepreneurship is all about, isn't it? They agreed and gave him the award. Now, upon his retirement in 2008, Dr. Kaufman was hired by the Jepson Foundation, I'm, I'm sorry, the Jepson Institute of Leadership at the University of Richmond in Virginia. There, he joined 14 other faculty from a variety of disciplines who study, analyze, and teach about what it means to be a leader and the characteristics of a good leader. Uh, Professor Kaufman was their history and humanities uh, expert. Now, I could go on and on about leadership and Professor Kaufman's work at, on it, but thank goodness uh, the Wyoming Institute of Humanities Research has decided to bring him here today instead. Uh, so. Uh, he will speak to us on such large discounts, uh, leadership, and humanities. I give you Professor Gunn. Thank you, Paul. Uh, I take it these replace this, right? So you can hear me. Uh, I'm honored, honored to be here, honored by your presence, to be sure. Uh, really grateful for your hospitality and uh, really excited about the, uh, the Institute for Humanities Research. It was certainly until I saw the barbed wire up there and <laughs> I don't exactly know what to make of that. Um, I am glad you didn't tell the full story. What uh, Dennis claimed, and it, it's quite true, he saved me from uh, polyester and uh, put me on the path of righteousness and 100% cotton. I, uh, it occurred to me f about 
10 minutes ago to start this way. Uh, some of you may have either read the book, Robert Penn Warren's uh, All the King's Men, or seen the movie, one of the two incarnations of the film. Have you seen the film, All the King's Men? It's a marvelous film. It's a wonderful book written by a Pulitzer Prize winning poet. There is a time when it's fashioned after the main character is Willie Stark, who is modeled after Huey Long, demagogue, politician, populist. And it is uh, his realization uh, of, uh, of how politics is played in, in, a, in a particular speech. He's come out uh, with a prepared speech. And he says, um, I have a speech here. And he reaches uh, awkwardly into his vest pocket and says, I have a speech here. Uh, I've come to tell you what the state needs. Uh, uh, and, but you are the state, he says. And you know what the state needs. Well, I want to tell you that I have a speech here. <laughs> and in the last uh, day, I have learned so much uh, about uh, my colleagues here and the Institute. I have a speech here. But it is all now in the fissures cracked um, with additions and subtractions. This is an apology for not making constant eye contact with you because I have squiggles that go every which way. I hope they're meaningful to you. And uh, I hope that uh, today's time is well spent. Pardon me for staring down a little bit more than I usually do. This afternoon's problem, in a nutshell, courtesy of Jeffrey Harpham, and I quote him, how to integrate the speculative, probing, exploratory, critical spirit of the liberal arts with the more worldly, results-driven orientation of professional education. And of course, to persuade all constituencies that the proposed solution does not degrade, dilute, or compromise the integrity of either the liberal arts or professional education but actually realizes the full capacities of each in a way that neither could achieve on its own. Seven years ago, as you've heard, I left a public university much like this one, departments that were conventional, history and religious studies, and dropped into something called leadership studies. And my challenge there was to help various constituents become acutely aware that leadership in their various areas of endeavor, uh, law, politics, business, uh, health care, uh, energy, begins with gratitude toward what they have inherited and a desire to steward it well, which may well mean to change its trajectories or to rekindle its, our, moral imaginations and to re-envision a good society. Leadership, if the arts and humanities are successful, will be informed by compassion, by a love of the way many concretely were and are, and by a yearning to give all a chance to live at their highest level. Now, figure this as my mission statement. And I grant you the genre, together with, with the previous nutshell task that I've set myself today could prompt reservations, perhaps your reservations. I want to consider three common objections to what colleagues often call the instrumental value of the arts and humanities. I will answer them or try to briefly, and then I will elaborate my responses, illustrating with a few of my experiences and prejudices, which you may find useful as your institute uh, expands and deepens its footprints on campus and in the state. To the objections, briefly stated. One, arts and humanities degrees didn't train us to address leadership concerns or policy matters. You, Peter, hibernate in a cozy, tenured corner of the liberal arts when on campus and to quote my colleague Stanley Fish, save the world on your own time. Two, mission statements are predictable and platitudinous. If succinct, they are welcome. If wordy, they are wearisome. Succinct 
and I quote, to promote, support, and showcase humanities scholarship across the university and state. It's not posted up there, but it's yours. Or wordy. The objection is number two, they beg the question, why? Why promote? Why support? Why showcase humanities scholarship? And objection number three, the professions don't want us. What remains of the liberal arts is a prelude to the really important stuff. Professional educators and the prof professions, healthcare, business, energy resources, agriculture, finance, accounting, law, engineering, environmental management, I've been to your catalog, are not interested, or if interested, only momentarily. So let's take those three objections one at a time. Arts and humanities, <coughs> traffic in interpretation. The proofs and truths originating in other departments, fuel education in and for the professions. Louis Menon mentions that Samuel Eliot, president of Harvard long ago, and for 40 years put a wall between liberalization and professionalization, between the liberal arts and prepa preparation for the professions, to detrimental effect. He, Menon, who I understand will be speaking to you in a year, suggests that interdisciplinarity, something curricular, structural, mm, relatively modest bridge work should work. I believe a more transgressive alternative is called for. As for Eliot's wall, well, I'm something that doesn't love a wall that wants it down, that sends the frozen ground swell under it. That's Robert Frost, of course. Well, of course it's not me. That's Robert Frost. But back to Fish, who echoing Derrida warns, beware of ends. Beware of doing something for a reward external to its own economy. Do it because it's its own reward and look for no pleasures beyond the pleasure of responsible rigorous performance, which we all agree is valuable. It's seemingly so simple and seductive. The phrase, its own reward, conjures up not only familiar statements about the intrinsic value of reading and seeing and listening, but also efforts to find pockets into which we might snuggle to keep away from the competition for dollars and students and attention and space, just in terms of the institute for humanities research. Is there yet a where there? So I'm something that doesn't love a wall. I'd like to return the UNI, the uni, and the UNI to the university. I'm going to suggest that shrill advisories like Fish's against what he, he calls foreign venues, the business school, public policy, health care, energy, won't enrich, but swiftly will erode the distinctiveness of pedagogy and research in the arts and humanities. And will put off and would will put off would be and could be collaborators among our colleagues in the university's pre-professional, paraprofessional, and professional programs. No. I fear it will take more than interdisciplinarity, which is the cake and frosting at some boutique liberal arts colleges, to confront, to confront and to find alternatives to the increasingly disturbing division between the arts and humanities on the one hand and the professions on the other. Now, Fish is emphatic. Save the world on your own time. And Fish is excessive. There is little evidence that literary study has made much difference in the injustice that permeates our world, he holds. Adding parenthetically to me, and that's Stanley Fish, that's good news. That's good news. Say again? During the Q&A, if you ask me, I have a number of Fish stories. He and I were colleagues back in the day. But let's move to the second objection, that efforts to formulate the instrumental value of arts and humanities amount to more or less meaning, meaningless rhetorical flourishes, or much worse, 
according to Jeffrey DeLeo, who's considered this at some length, they amount to the corporate, I'm quoting him, encroachment upon the arts and humanities. I'll preview in this instance, as in, other, as in the other two, what I'll be saying at greater length shortly, because I want to note an article in last year's Science Journal. Interesting, I'm still puzzling what the readers of science made of all the references to Bakhtin and Borges. But it is on, your, on the list. I gave you a list of end notes, roughly the, uh, the, the uh, pieces that helped me compose what I was uh, going to say and much of what I am going to say today, as well as some of my favorite quotes from my syllabus to start my students thinking and letting them know that I'm an oddball. I want to note that article because it empirically tests and confirms the contention that, and I quote, the capacity to identify and understand other subjective states allowing successful negotiation of complex social relationships so vital in the professions, is greater after reading literary fiction as opposed in the experiments to nonfiction and to non-reading. Now, this is something we'd all wager, or something we really know to be true. But why not welcome, what did I knock down? Oh. Just in case someone should call. Uh, but why not welcome the graphs, the, the, the charts, the statistics, the ostensibly empirical proof that the sensitivities literary fiction triggers, and that's a term used by the, the two researchers, David Comer Kidd and Emmanuel Castano, at the New School. The QED, what they demonstrate, is that literary fiction, which those two term polyphonic as opposed to in my terms, Grisham-esque, uniquely engages the psychological processes needed to sift more thoughtfully social experiences that are, and I quote them, scripted by convention and informed by stereotypes. It was welcome, but I'll elaborate that using less scientific arguments. As for corporate encroachment, I tend to see things the other way probably because my brother's fiance credits her years at the University of Iowa's famed Writer's Workshop with helping her to become one of the most sought after uh, and well remunerated technical writers in California. Lucky brother. But I'll holster that example and save to say that it's probably not always as easy as Cardinal Newman when he was projecting the idea of a university to maintain that useful knowledge is indistinguishable from trash. Suffice to say, for the moment, that I believe we can answer objections to the instrumentalist approach without moralizing or without reupholstering our projects and courses, without torquing the work we undertake so that close reading and contextual analyses are sacrificed for the sake of paraprofessional applications. I believe we can do that. I believe that institutes such as this can promote that. There are honorable ways for the arts and humanities to help faculty colleagues in pre-professional studies and the students whom we share, help them to translate the poetry of high aspiration in line, color, score, in the story, in history, in the pro, into the prose of effective governance. Translate the poetry of high aspiration into the prose of effective governance. Makes me want to hear my own voice. That challenge, of course, isn't new. The hurdles are reset in every generation. I quote, the commercial spirit of the country and the avenues to wealth which are open before enterprise create a distaste for study deeply inimical, inimical excuse me, to higher education. So noted Henry Philip Tappan, the president of the University of Michigan in 1851. Deeply inimical to the arts and humanities can seek safety in flight or in fish, as fish would wish, or view this as an ongoing summons or provocation to be amicable, 
to make new friends on our campuses and among our donors and among our alumni and in our legislatures and more on that coming. But now for the third objection. We are not wanted. I learned in some quarters over the last seven years working on this as I have. Quite the contrary. I was honored by an invitation uh, to lecture on the humanities this summer in Amsterdam at the Nyan Road Business Universität. I took the occasion, the preparation for it, as well as on-site conversations to consult with colleagues in professional education in finance. What I discovered uh, from Heidi Trout von Welsin Hoivik, I wanted to add that just so I could prove I could pronounce it, Professor Emerita in the Department of Strategy and Log Logistics at the Norwegian School of Management, Strategy, Logistics, Management. Oh my, to be that relevant, <sighs> to be that relevant. <laughs> Eric Jean Garcia at the Institut d'Etudes, Politique de Paris, Robert Posen, Blythe McGarvey, formerly of the Harvard Business School, and what I discovered ostensibly applies to professional education in healthcare, in public policy, in law slash government, energy resources, engineering, environmental management, even to preparation and the perpetuation of the professoriate. And this is what I learned. Number one, persistently in our studies, it's been about the bottom line. Going global should have the professions lifting their horizons, but in everything, in banking, trade, the delivery of services, ranging from healthcare, horticulture, to legal counsel, or cultural liter literacy, gets referred to that bottom line, usually the budget cuts. Number two, we now network rather than befriend, notwithstanding all the networks. <coughs> LinkedIn. Who is really linked in? The climate is chillier, and more often than not, and deplorably, self-interest governs network maintenance and gives ethicists among our fellow educators in professional schools fits. Those ethicists, number three, face a formidable problem. Preparing students by retreading case studies to tackle unanticipated issues. The world is a work in progress or, or, or regress. Crises yet to be dreamed await. So our colleagues in our professional schools tell me there is a need to foster an awareness of the moral life as something deeper and more firmly grounded than a set of rules. Otherwise, CSR, corporate social responsibility, even more frequently than it is now, one of my sources says, will be driven by window dressing objectives. Four, finally, and most important, curricula and professional programs are constructed to help professionals meet the performative rather than the transformative challenges leaders in business, nursing, ecosystem management, engineering, education, physics, pharmacy, I could go on inevitably encounter. There, students learn to manage. They acquire skills to manage product consumers, suppliers, stakeholders, even competitors, not to mention retainers or employees. All these and cohorts of colleagues are managed or handled with monitoring, incentives, coding. Such are the performative functions or skills that dominate learning in the professions. Not me. I wouldn't know. My colleagues tell me. Professionals in training, my sources tell me, and shall we add, professors in training simply do not engage a critique of the dominant economic, social, and ecological orders which could encourage them to implement worthwhile paradigmatic changes in their workplaces and their worlds. Now, if you strategically deploy conversations about Machiavelli, or Michelangelo with experiences that enable undergraduates and us all to maintain a steady, resolute, informed focus on maintenance tasks, on the performative, is it inconceivable, if we mix and mingle, 
the humanities and arts, that they would be better able to appreciate when times or tasks call for something transformative? I contend that an affirmative to that question is only beyond imagination if your imagining has yet to be transformed. Well, time to stop asserting and start appertaining or being somewhat pertinent, I hope. I am not a Blake scholar. But I now work in leadership studies where nihil humanum alienum, nothing is alien, everything goes. So the poem is London. I wander through each chartered street near where the chartered Thames does flow. Chartered, grooved, channeled, planned, rutted. That's me, not Blake. And mark in every face I meet, marks of weakness, marks of woe, in every cry of every man, in every infant's cry of fear, in every voice, in every band, the mind-forged manacles I hear. In the academy, we all get chained, and in the world of affairs, it applies as well to professional practices. In the academy, conferences, committees, routines, ruts, committees, I already said committees, more committees, forms, more forms, and of course, committees. Could we call them manacles? Some would, but they usually attribute the distracting or the distressing part of that to others, to custom, to campus conventions, in the world of affairs, to the government to regulations, to the economy, to the system. My generation, that was the favorite devil, the system. All those are the authors of our woes. But one reading of Blake has it differently, making us co-conspirators in our own servitudes. So if I asked my colleagues and my students to speak of the mind-forged manacles in the professions they inhabit or they aim to enter, the standards for entry or for measuring success, would they grow sufficiently self-conscious to write, subscribe to, or best of all, to avoid having to compose the following manifesto that attorneys, several attorneys published years ago. It pillories their practices which replaced the honorable objectives of disinterested inquiry with emphases on mastery and manipulation. I quote from their screed. We have become acculturated to an unnecessarily limiting way of seeing and experiencing law and lawyering, a way which can separate lawyers from their sense of humanity and their own values. When that separation occurs, the profession easily becomes experienced as only a job or role, and human problems as only legal issues. Care and responsibility yield to exigencies and stratagems, and legal education, instead of reflecting the aspiration and searching that embody Law and lawyering can all too easily become an exercise in attempted mastery and growing cynicism. I spent three years in law, uh, three years, three days in law school, so I wouldn't know. But they obviously have spent a longer period. Mind forged manacles in law, healthcare, commerce. Educated professionals not only become masters of their skills, but are mastered by them to the extent that their horizons of possibility are lowered. And the result in the world of affairs and in the academies, save us, roles and patterns that are at once our weapons, our hedges, in several senses of that word, and our prisons. So how to escape? I teach Shakespeare's Coriolanus. I do not ab abdicate my custodial responsibilities. My class learns about early Republican Rome as it was represented and reconceived by Livy and Petrarch. It learns about Elizabethan England, the absolutisms of Elizabeth I, who loved to sit for portraits, participate in processions, and generally be on display. And of James I, King of England, formerly King of Scotland, 
who kept a lower profile yet professed divine right to rule. The class learns of the struggles for control at the Church of St. Saviors, now Suffolk Cathedral, a stone's throw from the globe, the church where Edmund, brother of the bard, uh, was interred. And following Gerald Graff, I, his advice, I teach several of the interpretive controversies so that the play comes alive through its interpretations and perhaps, in my case, with a, an inordinate fondness for new historicists. But then I ask my students what nobility meant for Coriolanus and what nobility means to them. I ask them whether, how highly they value candor in their leaders. Coriolanus was candid to a fault. And when do they value candor? in their leaders. Always. Even when those leaders, as Coriolanus did, show contempt for those they lead. Do we deserve contempt as an electorate? Are our tribunes any less manipulative and self-interested than those in Coriolanus? Now people do respond dismissively to using the arts and humanities to raise perennial, timely questions. Politics, says one, is the highest art. There is, and I'm quoting him, there is the sculptor who shapes only the stone, the dead stone, and the poet, only the word, which is itself dead. But the statesman, shapes the masses, gives them statute, stature, and strength, breathes, breathes in, let me try that again, breathes in form and life so that a people arises from them. It is the statesman, not the sculptor or the poet. So says Joseph Goebbels in May 1933. That's a cheap shot, I know. In the arts and humanities, we are custodians of the past, even, those, even that past, which are not always welcome guests in the present, in the professions, but past will always be informative guests. And truth, to be told, truth be told, they will be interesting guests. We are, in the arts and humanities, barring the barbed wire, an interesting, inviting lot of people. I learned this summer in Amsterdam that my new friends at the Business University love their Rembrandt. But they had not heard about Svetlana Alper's influential book, Rembrandt's Enterprise, the Studio, and the Market. They had not heard that art history, controversially, had grabbed Rembrandt from the Rijksmuseum to drop him in the history of entrepreneurship. <coughs> the result was and is a Rembrandt from whom our contemporaries might learn something about building a brand, from whom Kim Kardashian and Kanye could learn a lot about self-commodification. And I discovered in my research, uh, the research I was doing in the international interference in the 17th century, 16th and 17th century uh, provinces uh, called the Low Countries, I learned that Rembrandt and Rubens had attested through their commissions and the completion of their commissions that it was the affluent Amsterdam and Antwerp entrepreneurs with an eye to the markets and a desire to attract into their precincts the best craftsmen of nearly all confessional stripes and spots. They did more to promote the toleration of the religiously reformed and unreformed than did the conspicuous prolific theorists who ordinarily get the credit. We are an interesting lot. This is an instance in the history of the arts in which background becomes foreground, something that really tremendously interests me. As you know, religion around Shakespeare. And that animates the series of monographs that Paul mentioned that I edit, studying the ambient pressure of religious cultures on iconic figures, asking what shaped their sensitivities, their craft, their output, and their appropriation. Asking also how environing conditions were reflected or refracted in their sensibilities. Now, ideally, that kind of custodial work, making the past present, 
might give us a new Emily Dickinson, a new Dante, a new Durer, a new great Scott. Where is Susan? <laughs> uh, new great Scott, a new Thomas Mann, Messiaen, Montaigne, Gibbon, Hobbes, Bob Dylan, Bob Marley, Billy Holiday, Ellen Ginsberg, and that's just to name a few of the books that are forthcoming. But ideally, it will give us a sense of the influence of the spirituality and secularisms on, on what their times and ours think about authority, community, personality. I li like to think of that as custodial work, combining archival excavation with what, what Collingwood called constructive imagination. People look at iconic figures as leaders, as models in business, in the arts, and what they think needs doing is to see what and how they live. By making background foreground, we see what's ambient, what's in the air, to learn what atmospherics made leadership possible. Now, I mention that because I want to add a footnote. Although we may, in the arts and humanities, foreground our work, we must do that. We will do that. We are the ambient, the background. The arts and the humanities, we are the pressure applied to the university policymakers, our colleagues, our students, that enables them to lead, to think outside the box, to avoid turf wars, to see the larger picture, even unto posterity. Well, it sounds biblical. I'd argue that what we do to enlighten, to enchant and occasionally shock makes leadership possible. I argue that we need to shock our colleagues and our students and to provide them skills they will need, particularly our students, to deal with the shocks and with the new light that gets shed on their soon-to-be professional lives, on life in the boardrooms, in the back rooms, and even in their backyards. Mark Edmondson refers to this challenge as navigating experience, but he also, somewhat surprisingly, explains to friends and students how we navigate by throwing our students off course. I suppose that comes pretty close to what I mean when I say it's incumbent upon the arts and the humanities to shock, to transgress, to defamiliarize. For me, that's part of what's called the gymnastics argument for the liberal arts. Enigmatic fictions, irony, misdirection, replace weights in the ellipt elliptical. The mind is a muscle. The goal is intellectual agility. The gymnastics argument is easily parodied. My friend and colleague Andy Abbott at the University of Chicago Sociology sociologist snappishly recalls the Oxbridge Dons and Fellows in the 19th century, 18th and 19th centuries, insisting that Greek phonemes would help their students rule India, as those subjunctives had some connections with the aspirations of subaltern populations. Our undergraduates in pre, para, or just plain professional programs, to name only our youngest constituents, may have little contact with South Asia, but the agility required to confront and master problems within their professions could be acquired by wrestling with others' deities, or with Dali, or with Dvorak, wrestling with plausible and persuasive presentations of what their worshipers or they might have had in mind, and with what they put inadvertently in our mind. What are we to make of it when Erasmus has folly praise herself or when Thomas More calls upon Hitlerday, which in Greek means nonsense, to speak disagreeable yet spot-on truths about early modern political uh, culture? Is Machiavelli's prince political science or political satire? Does Edward Hopper criticize alienation or celebrate the virtues of solitude? Arguably, some classics are classics because they are riddles. They summon our abilities to handle irony, to demystify. We cannot read the puzzling or the ironical without agility. Balancing options, proposing and puncturing, tried but 
less than true conclusions, experiencing such classics, placing them in the context of our lively conversations that ideally are informed by their contexts, historical context, but also by our prejudices. What do we mean by nobility? And our presuppositions about social harmony, individuality, sovereignty, tyranny, and integrity. That cannot but increase your dexterity and agility as professionals. So, I was reading, well, on your list, Rita Felsky. Her book, Uses of Literature, to prepare for today. And I came across her very close reading of Edith Wharton's House of Mirth. Not quite a classic, I suppose, but per certainly one of my favorites. So to see whether I could see what Felsky saw, I re-re-re-re-read re it. And watching the protagonists, Lily Bart's missteps, misreads, mistakes, you know I love alliteration, one also catches the minute details of milieu and moment. Figures of speech, filaments of thought, protocols of the fashionable New York society, their innuendos, their snobberies and covert cruelties, which show how a culture spells success, how it, that culture, reproduces itself through, and now I quote Felsky, the accretion of endless particulars and the steady accumulation of microscopic judgments. When, and now I'm quoting Wharton, the gaze of Trenor, one of the uh, romantic interests, gaze merges itself in the general stream of admiring looks of which she, Lily Bart, felt herself the center. We know that Lily is close to her class, too close to her class to know that the real social reality, the snobbery, the cruelty, are we too close? to recognize our mind-forged manacles until we see lilies. What we read, see, and experience about other times and places, Guernica, Goya's 3rd of May, Prokofiev's Nevsky, Eisenstein's Nevsky, Kurosawa's anything, trains us to discover, and then we train our students and our colleagues and our friends, if I may requote our lawyers, to discover that they or we have become acculturated to an unnecessarily limiting way of seeing and experiencing. So much for intellectual agility for now. Martha Nussbaum's appraisal of the limits of what she calls calculating intellect may suggest that such agility left to calculating, preparing, and reacting is not enough. It will remain undiscriminating, Nussbaum says, unless aided by the vivid empathic imagining of what it is really like to live a different sort of life. Education for the professions, take heed, because your patients, retainers, clients, colleagues, consumers do live different sorts of lives. Nussbaum's telltale emphasis on empathy tells us she's looking for an imaginative breakthrough to social justice. Whenever she writes about opera fiction poetry, and as Susanna will tell you, she writes about absolutely everything, she seems to be exhorting readers, judges, lawyers, economists, financiers, and physicians are her latest targets to take full measure of others' adversity, to acknowledge the complexity of others' strivings, and the perplexity of others' predicaments. I'm plumping for compassion. Compassion, presuming that the arts and humanities importantly contribute to its development, to our ability and our willingness to step outside our skins. Nussbaum knows more about such things, so let me stay in tow, in her way. She has an appointment at the University of Chicago as well as in philosophy and religious studies and the law school there and in philosophy and religious studies. Her colleagues in the first, Gary Becker and Richard Posner, uh, were and are, uh, one deceased recently, Becker, respectively at the forefront of what is now called the law and economics movement, which treats ordinary folks as, quote, rational maximizers of satisfactions. That's what you are and that's what I am. That's Posner's term. And the instruction in many schools of business, finance, and with Posner, public policy and law reflects that, to me, irrational choice. That's not Nussbaum. 
But to return to her, reading Charles Dickens' Hard Times brings schoolmaster Thomas Gradgrind, Dickens could really name them, couldn't he? Gradgrind's crude, ruthlessly utilitarian modus vivendi into the world of our students heading for the uh, professions. They notice Gradgrind's economics has an ever greater hold over the political and intellectual life of our own, their own society, Nussbaum says, than it did over the society known to Dickens' characters. I notice. Nussbaum continues that the type of cost-benefit analysis favored by economics has become so familiar in public policy, goodness, so pervasive in educational policy, that it is taken for granted. Uh, that was my addition. At the same time, public servants are less and less likely, back to Nussbaum, to be readers of the literature where they would discover a more complex vision of human life. Recall the article from Science Magazine. True. Might they find it there? Probably, if guided by instructors. As would students of cultural anthropology, comparative religion, and the histories of the Atlantic and Pacific worlds, their reward, almost certainly, a more complex vision that can only serve them well in whatever endeavor they choose to follow. Now, Hannah Arendt, whom I deeply respect, was unhappy that the task fell to the Institute for Humanities Research. She was not happy at all that that task of exciting compassion fell to the arts and humanities, to you. She thought a reliance on Dickens or Brahms or Brahma to jumpstart fellow feeling, to sustain it, was symptomatic of the loss of public spaces in which social life should be lived and would lead to solidarity. Sociologist and historian Richard Madsen, however, confirms that a liberal education was, this just came on, presentation, document, camera, there is no control of this device. You so bet. Fine. Huh? So you're fine. So I'm fine. Uh, I thought there was an audience response. Uh, <laughs> this device is, is about uh, 15 minutes from completion, so hold firm. Richard Madsen, however, confirms that a liberal education was and ought to be that public space. The arts and humanities used to be thought of, and I'm quoting Madsen now, used to be thought of as ways to produce a vital cultural center, a normative core for public discussion, based on the values of broad-mindedness, based on humility gained through an experience of the full complex of reality and a zest for innovation balanced by respect for tradition, an articulate, coherent, responsible left and right depend on the sustenance of such a vital center. Coherent, responsible, left and right, a world we have lost. To get that point of cross, I would suggest that it is necessary to be aggressive and to teach and to research transgressively. And this is what I mean. Transgressive teaching and research in the arts and humanities are hardly unprecedented. Some of you are familiar with it without having called it such. For the sake of the marginalized, many of our colleagues, some in, in this room, have disclosed the undertoes in hegemonic discourses, in the familiar Western narratives of liberalism. To transgress is to defamiliarize and to re-narrativize such things as, in my case, the history of immigration. Many novels and canvases transgress, but need our help in the arts and humanities to complete their task. I'm thinking at this moment of Goya's 3rd of May with its piston-like portrayal of the firing squad as impersonal as drones, or the Frost poem I've quoted. Many of my friends and colleagues think the term, good fences make good neighbors. Well, that's an aphorism that Frost set down as Frost's truth, but it's not. Frost is something that doesn't like a wall and that wants it down. So you can't miss his irony. 
And Frost's question, when we are building fences and walls, and when we are redistricting, are we keeping them out? Or are we walling ourselves and our descendants in? Something there is that doesn't love a wall. Good fences do not make good neighbors. They only keep the cattle from wandering from one property to the next. That sends the frozen ground swell under it. That wants it down. That transgresses boundaries. What I mean to say is that we in the arts and the humanities are needed not just to decode Warhol or Brecht or Milton, brilliantly done by Professor Nye today, by the way, but also to complete texts and artifacts, transgressions. Completion requires historical context and conversation, sharing our research and enabling our students to see how characters and colors and poetry scripts undermine facile general generalizations, challenge embedded social practices. Otherwise, it's just possible that fiction will reinforce detachment, reinforce John Plotz, who teaches political uh, politics and aesthetics, calls the bourgeois ethic of distant sympathy, something that TV miniseries are particularly good at doing. And that may be as detrimental as leaving Goya's, Wharton's, Dickens's, and Frost's on the shelves or in galleries unattended unplugged, deactivated. Compassion or commiseration can start with close reading and proceed subtly or unsubtly to current applications. Fish told me to save the world on my own time. Well, this is my time. I live at this podium. I live at my desk. I live with my books. And I live in my syllable, syllabi. And I live with my students. I live in my classroom. This is my time. Because we are a work in progress, and I won't add parenthetically regress, my colleagues, my students, and I, our habitat, our class, our characters, and our careers are at stake. Martin Roth's recent book, Beyond the University, suggests on your list also uh, a tame version of some of what I've been promoting. One, the custodial role of the humanities. Two, the gymnastics argument for intellectual agility or dexterity. And three, the responsibility of the arts and humanities to make compassion more capacious, to marinate, season, tenderize character. Versions of this, Roth says, were common during the 20th century's first 60 or so years, when the arts and humanities were increasingly curriculum eclipsed by the natural and social sciences. People were asking, Roth continues, whether traditional ideas of the liberal education were merely ar archaic vestiges of a, or a mode of education that should be left behind, a luxury item, as Susanna phrased it. In the 20th century, the strategy was to underscore the importance of what our predecessors called moral education and to tout the value of an educated citizenry. That's how the arts and humanities were and still are by many. I'd agree that there is some similarity between Roth's then and my now. Yet I'm less concerned with that bantamweight phenomenon that qualifies today as an educated citizenry and much more concerned with putting in place self-conscious, self-critical, sensible, compassionate leaders in healthcare, jurisprudence, business, environmental management, technology, and education. And to that end, I believe, opportunities for collaboration with the professions and educators in the professions is possible. I work with Augustine. I'm drafting this particular paragraph on the morning of November 5th. The election results are in. The Republicans justifiably effervescing. Ted Cruz in Texas bathing in the bubbly, along with others celebrating a win that for Cruz and kind certifies American exceptionalism. And the thought occurs to me, how do I write about and teach Augustine transgressively at this time of triumph and triumphalism? Does Augustine tell us anything useful about the brittle ambitions and pretensions that attend a rise and precede a fall. Augustine, a late 4th and early 5th century Christian bishop in North Africa, read his classical literature and history as well as his faith sacred texts. 
He also read the triumphalist predictions of predecessors who celebrated the conversion of their empire to Christianity, but soon saw that his God, their God, for unfathomable reasons, had given his faith an edsel of an empire, disintegrating. Augustine lived through political and socioeconomic, not to mention military upheavals and embarrassments so severe that Brian Ward Perkins subtitled his wonderful book about the sack of Rome in 410 and its scuffed up aftermath, The End of Civilization. Civic-spirited Romans who circled the Mediterranean had thought their professions were stable. Their empire was exceptional, that they could cruise on eternally. Their empire was without end, the imperium sine fine. An empire with a manifest destiny. So for his part, Augustine set out to change the narrative. Recoil, reorientation, and re-enchantment. He reanalyzed and re-narrativized Rome's expansion from the early innings of the Republic in the 490s, give or take, plus or minus, B.C., nearly to the last at bat in the West in the 420s. He wrote of patriots moved to build and maintain reputations. What we might call name or face or fame or glory was critical. It all fueled what Augustine dubbed the lust to be first. Pardon the Latin. I love it. The libido principandi. The lust to dominate. The libido dominandi. And worked to grow a formidable enterprise. But for Augustine, the Romans fame fetish sloped or tended toward an inordinate desire to acquire. What Augustine did, did here, I believe, is what Wittgenstein wants us in the humanities and arts wants us all to do, to go down to the foundations, to sink our question marks, I'm quoting, deep down. Now, Augustine's been commemorated for a series of successes. He contested sectarian impulses, sorry about rushing through this, put self-promoting charismatic rivals in their place and effectively argued against colleagues who minimized human imperfection. He contributed meaningfully to secular and religious theorists alike who stand watch on the frontier between church and state. If you didn't catch all that, uh, pick up anything on Augustine and you'll hear all about that. But I now commend him, after a close reading of his monumental City of God, I now say, that one can formulate applications that will prompt conversations not only about the text, but conversations that will help us recognize that piety is reinforcing our business as usual. Piety is reinforcing our sense of exceptional character or manifest destiny, just as Rome's can be powerful, especially even in crisis, when a holy other, Holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, for Augustine also, H-O-L-Y, a holy other concept of commonwealth and flourishing should be, broadly speaking, redemptive. Recoil, reorientation, reenchantment, and finally, resilience. Augustine looked to build resilience. He proposed changing the rules for the faithful. They would live as pilgrims as resident aliens. They would see things differently, cling less tenaciously to worldly possessions. Pilgrims would acknowledge that civic piety was served by others with different values, other loves, Augustine said. Other loves that were inferior to the love of the faithful for the world, for their kin and kind, for creation, for Wyoming, which paid forward God's love for them which enabled them to rebound from both exceptionalism and its discontents. Two Stephanies, Le Manager and Foote, in a recent PMLA article, could have been talking about Augustine, but they had the humanities in general in mind. The humanities, they say, are especially suited to speak of the rhetoric of crisis because they demand that we understand how narratives about place and about value and about the relation of social actors to those ideas are made. And with Augustine, at least, we should add remade. Here's another reason, along with Madsen, that our friends, our trustees, our friends in the professional education, 
among alumni and in the legislature ought to appreciate what we do. Find and connect with those friends. Let them expand their number. They will know how. Help them understand what and why. Now, your system, public education, is different from what I experienced at UNC in Chapel Hill, but there, years ago, a small set of faculty colleagues and I formed a legislative liaison committee, and the task was to identify and assist friends of the college and the legislature and the Board of Governors and among our alumni. The legislature particularly was packed with lawmakers who regarded their flagship university as a sinecure for folks in the arts and humanities, for us, and as a crop of professional programs to be fueled and fed. We worked with the few friends we had. They helped us make more new friends. And with trustees' help, we brought them to campus, invited them to counsel us, found that they were flattered and honored to be a part of that enterprise, and asked for their help in convincing their colleagues. It was a long slog, but there were successes. And in the face of fervent opposition, which ideally you've been spared. We managed to put together an institute for the humanities and a good deal more support services for the arts and humanities in a university that was trending in the opposite direction. Now, I know I've been jostling assertion and application, but bear with me just a little longer, just a little longer, I promise, and permit a nod to our curriculum and our students and one that gives today's address its title. So we're back again. It's early November, cruise time, and I'm thinking about these things. And it's also pre-registration at my college. Advising appointments with freshmen. Each must select a first-year seminar. And there are courses entitled Wagner and Weber, Epidemics and Empire, Democracy and Deficit. I'm not the only one who's addicted to alliteration. <laughs> But advisees can select alternatively baseball films, video games, crimes and cops. Rita Felsky, too facetiously, I think, bundled such pleasures, imagining a course on sex toys and serial killers. <laughs> so the final question I want to tackle is how might the arts and humanities, while they one, fulfill their custodial responsibilities, and two, assert their powers, to develop interest, intellectual rigor and agility, compassion, character, and resilience, how might we undermine those who search our catalogs to find those extremes and discredit the efforts to connect meaningfully with educators and with education in the professions? How might we defeat the art popes and Roger Kimball, some of you will know the reference, who delight in caricaturing what we do and what we probe and what you think about. I love films. I teach with films. I like baseball. Alas, the Cubs. <laughs> I'm in awe of my colleague, whose beat is early modern drama, but who publishes on and teaches video games and graphic novels. Intramurally, at home in the arts and humanities, I think we have work to do. Reconciling the elite humanities with what Toby Miller called the populist humanities, media studies, rhetoric and communication and the like. And those connections forged, without forfeiting standards, can help us make connections with the more demonstrably practical pre- or paraprofessional studies. Our allies on this front are our students. So come advising time, I'll assign Hamlet, Act 4, Scene 4. It's all but swallowed up by the protagonist's soliloquy from which I drew today's title. Sure, he that made us with such large discourse looking before and after gave us not that capability and godlike reason to fust in us unused. Now, you may call that the scene at the time the protagonist is contemplating his nearly interminable delays, uh, delaying the revenge on his uncle for having killed his father, married his mother, et cetera, et cetera. 
He watches a Norwegian army march through Denmark on its way to Poland. This army of such mass and charge, I'm a frustrated and bad actor, this army of such mass and charge, led by a prince, and that would be Fortinbras, strong shoulder, strong arm, whose spirit with divine ambition puffed, exposes what is mortal and unsure to all that fortune and death and danger dear, even for an eggshell, rightly to be great, is not to stir without great argument, but greatly to find quarrel in a straw when honor's at stake. Really, I ask, Hamlet's hesitation to take revenge for his father's murder measured against Norway's determination to fight for a plot in Poland only momentarily makes him keen to push his own plot forward. But he relapses, leaves us with a glimpse of the illogic of Norway's position, 20,000 casualties for a straw, for an eggshell. He also leaves us with a set of enduring dilemmas, and so should courses in the arts and humanities, the so what of our studies. How honorable is honor, which calls for revenge? With such large discourse, shouldn't we problematize received wisdom? Might we not examine how to live as well as how to earn a living and sift critically through the unwritten rules of our professions? our acculturation. Might we with such large discourse cultivate that set of habits of the mind or dispositions to reflect, assess, argue, and persuade? When we do it in our colloquies, sharing our research, the enthusiasm will be infectious. Our students infected, affected, and ours. Get them thinking there and early. Of course, what we first must do, and it will not be easy, is to accept Tony Del Banco's advice and trust, and I'm quoting here as I come to an end, whether they study accounting or philosophy, hotel management or history, the vast majority of undergraduates are capable of engaging the big questions, questions of truth, responsibility, justice, beauty, among others once assumed to be at the center of college education. My experience is that many, if not most, students bound for the professions as well as faculty colleagues who more directly than we can help them get there can agree with Oliver Wendell Holmes that life is painting a picture and it is not doing a sum. Moreover, to borrow from Stephen Collini's study of notably transgressive colleagues of our Levis, and John Ruskin will be known to some of you in literature and art and in history. Transgressive teaching will enable and clarify the convictions of those who already feel intuitive reservations about the conventional transgressive teaching really does prompt those intuitive reservations where there are none. True, if the arts and humanities give over too much to this transgressive task, they could forfeit close reading, a shame, a shame, and no, no, far more than a shame. They would risk superficiality and self-indulgence. But if they give too little to this task, they'll never do what E.J. Garcia and others in the professions hope from us when they ask that we help our students in pre-para and professional programs envision and implement paradigmatic transformations with poise, not panic. With discipline, intelligence, integrity, and compassion. Institutes of this sort, with institutional support, and with a lively curiosity and understanding of educators in our professional schools, an understanding that is built on the bedrock of friendships as well as colloquia, can restore the UNI, the uni, to university. But I'll say again, this all starts so much more simply. And I'd suggest that it restarts again whenever we treat our undergraduates, whenever we treat our partners in humanities research as intellectuals, rather than as consumers. You've been very kind to listen as long as you have.
very much for your attention. I've got two things to say. One is that uh, we will have a uh, reception afterwards, just outside the doors here. But before we do that, uh, we have some time for questions. Uh, I know that many of us have thoughts of going in a variety of directions. Uh, and uh, if you would uh, pitch them to uh, Peter, uh, please do so. I think I lost the I lost the mic somewhere. No, I got them both. I got them both. Uh, questions, blowback, uh, objections, reservations, um, uh, adulation. I'll take anything. <laughs> <laughs> Stanley Fish is a, was a wonderful colleague. That he should write this after carrying a professorship in law and uh, actually leading a university, University of Illinois Circle Campus, is astonishing to me. But my favorite stories about Stanley is that uh, uh, some of you will know the David Lodge novels. Uh, Stanley Fish is the model, as some of you may know, for Maura Zapp, who is a character uh, of, of, <laughs> of, my gosh, what Promethean character uh, of sorts. Just uh, uh, an uh, odd, outspoken. Um, as much as I disagree with Stanley on this point, he's willing to get into his beautiful jet black Porsche and drive down to the public library in, uh, uh, in nowhere, North Carolina, or to speak to high school students. He takes um, uh, uh, speaking engagements and is a model for me in that regard. Uh, and we'll talk with, not at, but with anyone who will listen. So I do want to utter that disclaimer, though I completely disagree and think he's got his head up his ass here uh, in terms of, the, uh, of what our time is and what our responsibilities are for social justice. In his own conduct, he is quite the contrary. So I'm glad you asked that, so you let me uh, utter that. Um, uh, One of the places that you described in your talk where you, where you do this kind of, uh, let's say, proselytizing, explaining, self-marketing, is in the legislative, friends of the legislature committee? Uh, legislative liaison, yeah. I wonder if you could say a little bit more about that. How it came about, what, it sounds like that was a good experience and you felt there was some good results. What do you think were, were the key aspects of that experience that enabled you to succeed? Well, there were several ingredients. First of all, uh, at the University of North Carolina, we uh, were not as fortunate as you. We were one of several state universities. Um, and, but we did have alumni who were um, strategically placed. And uh, they had experiences that at least they cherished in the courses that may not have led them to their professional degrees. Uh, so the, the problem with moving to the legislature is, 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 is coming, you know, butting up against those folks who think that what, we, what people do in the arts and humanities, these are sinecures. Uh, that their flagship uh, university is really a wreck when it comes to the arts and humanities, where those of us hang out to do our specialized research. And by taking them seriously and bringing them to campus and talking uh, you know, about um, having folks who are more adept than I am about making line and color and sound and song relevant um, to, the, uh, to an educated citizenry, I give it short shrift, Two, ending the, the gridlock and polarization and why people are talking past each other. Madsen's idea of finding that common core, uh, common language, he says, and that the humanities can have that, that role. Um, but I found, I was lucky. I got, I got a great guy to, to work with. We got different assignments. And we put in place, uh, and I think this was the smartest thing and it wasn't my idea, we put in place one of our best, our most conspicuous scientists. Uh, a fellow by the name of Tom Myers, who then went on to Los Alamos. He chaired the committee, and so his, and he brought oodles of dollars in through his lab and through the research triangle. So by having a friend, this is what I meant by based on bedrocks of friendships, having friends among conspicuous humanities people and scientists and social scientists, trustees, and in your development office, you, you'll find those friends. And they will make friends for you. You just have to explain to them why it's so important, because they can speak about it anecdotally. My favorite professor, you know, was Paul or Suzanne or Susan or you. Uh, but that's, you know, that, that they need a little more, more push than that.
to sell. When you come up with that rationale, whether it's my rationale or others, they don't like to hear, don't use the word transgression when you're talking to legislators. You don't want to talk about that. Uh, if you're going to use you know, recoil, don't use recoil. Don't even use reorientation. Maybe re-enchantment, but certainly resilience. You know, what you're imparting is resilience. That rings with legislators. Yeah. Is there a hand that I haven't What's your uh, area? Uh, I, I work in English during early modern English studies. Oh, great! Yeah, all right. We'll talk after that. Yeah. You are not modernists. You work in, you are not quite as English as I do. No. No. So how do you do the balance of moving from your area of specialty to, shall we say, making a leap to help the students see that this is the same thing that's still going on, the lessons that they learn, the analysis, and the conversation that they're learning. It's an important question. Well, you know, uh, Corey Landis doesn't give us an answer. He just raises the question. His candor and nobility, twice, his mother, of course, calls him too noble. That's to be expected, his mother. Uh, but so do so the, the, the patriarchs, the Senate, Menendez. He's too noble, too noble. He speaks uh, what he's thinking without thinking. Uh, and that is, uh, what he's thinking is, is contempt for the commoners who are so easily swayed. So we move from there to, uh, I show them that wonderful uh, clip of... Uh, of uh, Brutus, played by uh, Marlon Brando, who, so, who sways the population, you know, uh, for they are all honorable men. I've come to bury, not praise Caesar, but of course, he's so deceptive. So then I take them to the 21st century and the latest election, or I'll give them, I gave, give them the two speeches uh, from the 2004 convention, Obama's and uh, Al Sharpton's, and I ask them, you know, what is effective and where are you swayed? and are you too easily swayed? So we can ask those questions. With, with the, the purpose of, of, of doing uh, Hamlet's uh, is to have them think, uh, not to be too swayed, ask, ask behind that snappy title. Because behind many of those snappy titles, uh, somebody mentioned there's a course here, baseball films, and s looking at America through its, its, its uh, flirtation, I guess it's more than that, it's romance with baseball, you understand the milieu of America. You understand background becomes foreground. And um, so if they, if they smart enough to probe the class and ask what they will be learning and will they get behind the glitz uh, of, uh, uh, I don't know how you would do that with sex toys and the serial killers, but you know, m m I do know my colleague does graphic novels. She turned me on to graphic novels. I, I think they're astonishing. And um, it, it makes them discriminating uh, intellectually, not just consuming the, you know, the, the, the label or the title. I don't think I answered your question. So how do I, yeah, so how do I do it? So I bring, yeah, I, I, I no longer teach graduate students which is, I, I miss that terribly if you're a graduate student in this room. I don't miss it at all if you're not. Uh, <laughs> uh, one of my colleagues had the uh, chutzpah to uh, list himself as co-author of, of all the dissertations he supervised, and to an extent, <laughs> it's true, uh, that I don't even want to think about. But um, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the undergraduates, I think can be our, our allies when they become really, uh, when they sense their power to sh sift between classes. And I, I don't have to do freshman advising. I love to do it. I love to do it. I'll just say one for the word on that. One of the graduate students in philosophy, Susanna, one of your people, where are you, Susanna? One of your people, when I asked them to go around the room and ask me why they were doing what they were doing, said, I, you know, a philosophy professor changed my life. I want to change other people's lives. Um, this is uh, a way to, to uh, I, I know, it's a lot, it says a lot of nerve to say that, but it's... Well, actually, I'm going to follow up with that same student talked to me after your lunch today, and he had a question for you, and I really wanted to go ask you because I wanted you to have up. So now I'm going to ask his question. He said, yeah, well, that was great to say, but this is all preaching to the choir. He said, what about people like my parents? He said, they're not doing it. And then he did something. 
we don't care about this. So everything we said now is how to talk to other academics and how to talk to educated people, students. How do we reach the populace, not like we're just slaying them, but the integrity? How do we make the humanities matter to boys and boys? Uh, no, I, I think that's fair, and, and back in the day, when I was trying to sell a religious studies major, um, I would simply talk about people who were religious studies majors. I, they, the students would come in and say, I, I love the courses that I'm taking, but what do I tell my family when I go home and say, you know, folks, I'm not doing pharmacy, I'm doing religious studies. And, and they immediately think, you know, a priest. Um, <laughs> And you have to give them the anecdotal evidence that, uh, but how you speak to the, the, the people and they're, uh, they, they, you know, it, I, I know this is going to sound trite. Uh, and I know that, that, that uh, Paul has gone through many more struggles than I can imagine uh, with, with Saturday College. But in terms of what we did with our extension division, you build it and they will come. The hoi polloi, the populace, they will come. And they will come to hear a great debate. I, I, I went, there's a, some of you may know an ethicist by the name of Stanley Harawas, who is almost, who is much more histrionic than I am. And Stanley and I had a dog and pony show. And I was the dog. But uh, basically, we, we, we actually did this at Duke several, for several times and at UNC. And uh, we had groups of uh, basically parents coming in for their parents' weekend. And that's what we would do. Um, the Institute can begin to target. I don't know whether you have a parents weekend here at Wyoming, but uh, you know, the parents, we, parents can, cannot, will never, just like some legislators, they will never get out of the idea that college is the first four years of professional training rather than uh, the, the place where you ask the really important questions that will make you happy or flourish in your profession. And if you say that, words like happy and flourishing, as opposed to the bottom line, some will walk out and you've lost them. And some who stay in their seats are the ones you just need to draw in and reel in. Uh, and then some of the students, like that particular student, um, his problem is not convincing his folks, he's already a graduate student in philosophy, um, his problem will be with suffering as we all do with the relative poverty and the ongoing question of relevance uh, until you know, we conquer the world. And that won't happen in my lifetime, certainly. So the answer to the question is some parents are lost to us and some will take their kids from us and some will come to these sessions and some will come to realize that um, you know, uh, the, the, their lives, they, that as the word lifelong learner could actually apply to them and enrich their life and therefore, there may be some value in having, in this case, a person be a professional philosopher. Yes, we'll keep going. Um, I, I guess I am part of the choir that Susanna was referring to, and I, I really appreciate how you talk about the humanities and what we have to offer in our corner of campus and wider society. As I'm, lo I'm looking around to see who's here, and one, I'm going to just point out one of my colleagues, Myron Allen, from the math department. It's great to see Myron here. Math is not one of the departments that's noted for its inclusion in the humanities division. And I wonder if we, do we have a do we risk when we say, look, we in the humanities are taking care of cultivating socially broadly these questions of the, the capacity for compassion and leadership in innovation, um, that, that we say we're where it happens. I mean, I'm not by any stretch of the imagination as math literate as, as I should be, but I understand math to be a place where truth and beauty and language are being explored. So I, I, guess, I'm, I guess I'm just asking how we connect in really meaningful, uh, mutually respectful ways with colleagues uh, uh, across, our, across our campus. Yeah, well, in a, in, in a way, the, your question it contains the answer in it, that where you say, I'm not really yet familiar. I add the, added the yet. Um, there is a way in which our colleagues, uh, you know, we deal where I am at the University of Richmond, we deal with my colleague, who is my colleague in math? Um, good to see you. We, we, I usually deal with you when I'm knocking on your door and I'm saying, 
you know, my advice is failing calculus. <laughs> is there something we can do? Rather than the kind of conversation we can have uh, in, in neutral territory or socially, um, where we understand, I can be begin to become more familiar with uh, what my students in business, why they need calculus, why my students in, in uh, uh, medicine, why, and why calculus becomes so difficult. For some of the students I work with, I work with uh, an undocumented population who come from rural high schools, and they have a lot, they have their pre-calculus, but from undersourced high schools. So we work together to, uh, with two of my colleagues, one in math and one in computer science, to help them find courses that become more meaningful, and then they end up as business majors in finance, and this is all to the well and good, but they become, you know, they, we become collaborators. My colleague, I'm thinking of, of uh, the, two, the two in particular, uh, and it just so happens that math and computer science, computer science is on the ground floor uh, leadership uh, building and math is on the upper floor, so you fellows are closer to God than leadership. Um, <laughs> but it is, it is a way of starting that kind of conversation. It is critical, obviously, for them to have professional training. Our leadership majors are pushed into a, either a second major or a minor that w where they can actually learn uh, what's going on in the professions. And then we send them out. Uh, they, they have a re two required internships, one in terms of the, uh, what we call the, I suppose you call the nonprofit sector, and one shadowing the folks in Altria or in Washington or along with the political candidates. So the, the, you know, they have those experiences. It's not that we under, the humanities undervalues. It's that the humanities now have a place alongside. The best way to do it is uh, with that friendship and collegial relationship. And I don't know whether you have an institute for the arts and sciences or an institute where the sciences welcome the humanities, but I would think that in humanities research, certainly at the University of North Carolina, around that table, there were individuals from a variety of professional disciplines in the humanities center. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Some 60 years ago, this is in defense of <coughs> Byron Allen and mathematics. My most important or most insightful teacher in high school was my math professor, who probably was the greatest humanist that I've ever met. Uh, and uh, he made one statement to us as kids. I was 15 at the time, and he would always say, we know knowledge, and we are a knowledge-based society. And you could say, you know, knowledge is fine and dandy, but knowledge is nonsense if you cannot apply it to yourself. And it didn't make that much sense to me at the time, but over the years, that is the thing that I think was most central. Uh, you know, we. And this is our business in, in, in university, we teach knowledge, but we don't teach people, well, we can't teach people what to do with it. Uh, and, and, and this is somewhat the failure of teaching, you know, that, that we do not get through to the student what to do with it why it is important that they said what. So, maybe I'm not making myself clear. No, no, I, I, you are. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, but uh, uh, I think that's where it, somewhat the failure is also in the humanities, you know, because we try to behave like the knowledge-based society and forwarding knowledge. Uh, but I, 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 you're not only making yourself clear, you're making yourself clearer than I was, so I'm really uh, envious. That, that's, in a way, what I'm saying is that the so what question needs to be asked in the classroom, but also among when we colloquy with each other and when we colloquy with our, with our colleagues studying energy management or studying business or studying math and calculus. And uh, there was a, an example given today about calculus. Uh, the, uh, uh, I think it was one of your colleagues 
uh, it was uh, the oh. fellow in business, John, right? Oh. Who, who, who said that, you know, somebody re recognized at one point why they studied calculus somewhere in their second year of business school when they were asked, you know, at what point does ad the advertising budget become dysfunctional? And it was, tell me, what, do you remember the, what the answer was? was where the, the derivative of? It was the first derivative. It was the first derivative, which I know nothing about. But they, and the student then said, now I understand why I took calculus. We're more culpable in the humanities because we, sell, we too seldom ask the so what question. We too seldom ask them to apply to themselves what they're learning in, in Milton and Shakespeare, uh, in, in cultural anthropology or comparative religion. And it, get, it gets to be dangerous when you're in religious studies because you, you don't want to teach them you know, the Gospel of Matthews and ask them, so how does this affect your belief? Because that's not where you want to go in a religious studies department. So it's really tender, uh, you know, you walk gingerly there. But in, in the history part of myself, uh, unless, you know, you ask them questions about nobility and sovereignty, and how important is sovereignty? Was it back then, and why is it less so now? Unless they understand why they don't like us in that part of the world, which has historical roots that go not only back to the Crusades, but back behind the Crusades. Um, and, that, and then what they can do about that failure of mutuality. So I agree wholeheartedly, and I thank you. I mean, I, it really is the clearest that I've heard myself uh, back, echoed. Maybe yeah. Socrates was the greatest of Caesar by, silly, by asking silly questions. <laughs> I, I, I tell you, I assign Milton Friedman's Capitalism and Freedom, and immediately after, I assign Plato's Apology and Socrates' Defense. I ask him, what's the difference between Milton Friedman and Plato's Socrates in terms of not only the questions, but the resistances, the transgression, the, the, tra well, the transgressive uh, character of each. And, and it, it worked. That's their, their midterm exam, one of the essays. So I don't think Milton Friedman would enjoy the comparison, but Socrates might. Okay, now that we've decided, decided to talk about people's exams, uh, <laughs> maybe it's time to draw this to a close. Um, would you please uh, join us for a reception afterwards? Uh, Peter will be available for comments, questions, rejoinders, uh, and so on. Uh, but will you join me now in thanking him for his time?